Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Health and Safety Matters podcast, which is a monthly podcast which focuses on all the latest health and safety news from across the UK. My name is Mark Sennett. I'm the CEO of Western Business Media, which is the publisher of Health and Safety Matters. We're delighted that this podcast is once again sponsored by the Health and Safety event, which if you haven't heard, the dates of this event have now moved to the 7th to the 9th of September 2021, and it will take place at the NEC in Birmingham and be co-located alongside the fire safety event, the emergency services show, the facilities event, and the security event. So if you'd like to register for free and get access to all of these events, all you need to do is go to www.healthandsafetyevent.com. So as long as listeners of this podcast will know, we normally feature a couple of interviews in every edition and also we cover the latest news. As this is coming to the end of the year, we actually just recently ran a massive webinar with the BSAF, which is on UKCA marking. Now, if you haven't listened to that already, I'd very much encourage you to do so by going to our website, which is hsmsearch.com and clicking on the webinars tab. And you can listen to it on demand for free and get CPD points for attending. So today's edition is a little bit different. I am covering the news. But actually, on top of that, I'm doing a more extended interview with Alan Murray, who actually answers some of the questions that we didn't get time to answer during the webinar. So definitely worth sticking around to listen to Alan's interview. It's always great to catch up with Alan on what is an absolutely vital topic, because as I sit here now in the second week of December, we are steamrolling or marching towards potentially a no deal in terms of Brexit. And this will have massive implications in terms of UK CA marking and obviously what's now CE marking. So definitely a topic worth sticking around to listen to. We will return in January for our next podcast, so keep an eye out. But without further ado, I want to go into the news. And many of you will know, you can see all the latest health and safety news on our website. We've got all the latest products, prosecutions, news that go through the Health and Safety Matters website. All you need to do is visit www.hsmsearch.com and you can see that news product etc daily you can also sign up for a twice a weekly newsletter that we send out this information straight to your inbox and on top of that you can sign up to receive the magazine six times a year as well completely free via that website so definitely worth heading over to hsmsearch.com but the first news story i want to talk about is it's normally the biggest news story of the year if i'm honest it's it's the hsc the health and safety executives annual statistics. So HC has released Britain's annual injury and ill health statistics. So these statistics show that Great Britain is still one of the safest places in the world to work with the lowest number of deaths on record. This has consistently been dropping, as as you'll all know, over the last uh, well, nearly two decades, to be quite frank, certainly the last decade. But however, though, more than half of Britain's working days lost in 2019 stroke 2020 were due to mental ill health. The HSE's annual report includes statistics for work-related ill health, workplace injuries, working days lost, enforcement action taken and the associated costs for Great Britain. The emergence of COVID-19 as a national health issue at the end of the first quarter of 2019-2020 does not appear to be the main driver for the data seen that's been changed throughout this year, although it is possible that COVID-19 may be a contributory factor. The HSC has been at the heart of work across the government for getting Great Britain's workplaces COVID secure. And as part of the HSC's response to COVID-19, it's continued to support the wider health response throughout working closely with the national public, health bodies, local authorities and local health teams. But the figures show around 693,000 workers sustained non-fatal injuries in 2019 straight 2020 and 1.6 million workers suffering from work-related ill health. The statistics compiled from the Labour Force Survey and other sources illustrate that in Great Britain in 2019 2020 period, there were 111 fatal injuries at work. As I just said, 1.6 million working people suffered from work related illness. 38.8 million working days were lost due to work related illness and workplace injury. And 325 cases were prosecuted and resulted in conviction and fines that totaled £35.8 million. In 2019-2020, the estimated economic cost to Great Britain totaled 16.2 billion, with 38.3 million working days lost. As I just said, so those are the headline figures. They come out annually, as just everybody knows. The positive is it's on the decrease again in terms of the amount of fatal injuries and amount of instances. The concerning factor is the amount of mental health ill days lost through that, and I strongly suspect that will increase even more so next year when we look at the impact of COVID-19's had on this year. So it's 
been a difficult year for everybody. COVID has dominated the headlines. I think we all thought Brexit was going to. It certainly hasn't. And these statistics paint a mixed picture. Overall, we have to be optimistic and positive that deaths and workplace injuries go down. And Britain is, on these figures, the safest country to work in. So positives there. But I think we have to look at what is the emerging issue that we discuss quite a bit on this podcast. And that is mental health. Far too many days being lost to mental health. But there are many great initiatives, great charities focusing on mental health. Mental health doesn't have the stigma in the workplace that it used to. And it really is a focus of your jobs now. You're not just a health and safety manager. It comes down to also focusing on mental health as well. And hopefully this will continue to be addressed as we go on. These figures will go down. But I suspect my gut says on the back of COVID in a difficult year, next year's figures of work days lost for mental ill health will be somewhat higher. So moving on to our next story, and that is that IOS Chief Executive Bev Messenger has announced her retirement. So Bev has been in her role now for four and a half years, and she has announced that she's set to retire from this role in the middle of next year, 2021. Bev has also been a guest on this podcast, as many of you know, and she, she, she was great to sit down and interview, and it's well worth you going back in our archives, which you can do through the iTunes podcast store, or over on YouTube, or on Podbeam, or if you're using Android phones, you can go through Google Podcasts as well, which is well worth listening back to that. But, you know, back to Bev for a moment. During her time, she's overseen a successful implementation of IOSH's five-year strategy, which was Work 2022, Shaping the Future of Safety and Health, and she's also initiated and led the comprehensive and successful transformation of this programme. Since October 2016, Bev has taken IOSH from a UK-focused membership organisation with a financial deficit which IOSH says was in danger of not meeting its charitable objectives, to a purposeful and internationally respected professional body serving over 47,000 members and spanning almost every sector in the world from over 130 countries. So Dr Bill Gunyan, who's the chair of the IOSH Board of Trustees, in talking about Bev, said, we required someone inspirational and capable of transformation for IOSH and addressing the many challenges that we had. This is exactly what Bev has done, leading by example, guided by strong and inclusive values and principles. So throughout the challenging period, Bev and the Irish team also continue to deliver key projects that will achieve the plan improvements for its members worldwide. IOSH has also worked with the World Health Organization and others to create COVID-19 advice and guidance, and it's provided 30 webinars on safe and healthy work during the COVID-19 pandemic, which attracted over 22,000 attendees from over 100 countries. Its COVID-19 resource web pages have been visited apparently by more than 225,000 times. Bev Messenger herself has commented on her impending retirement and said, after amazing four and a half years leading this exceptional organisation and working with a brilliant team and hundreds of inspiring volunteers, 2021 will be the right time for me to pursue long-held plans to develop a non-executive portfolio, which I postponed this year to lead the institution to the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. I couldn't be prouder of the hard work everyone at IOSH has done to take us on this journey from where we started in 2016 to the stronger position we're in now. There has rarely been a time when safety, health and well-being at work and the daily efforts of an OSH profession have been so vital. And if COVID-19 has shown us anything, is that looking after the well-being of people is key to resilient and effective organisations and a better, more sustainable world. Well, there's not a lot more I can add than that. Bev has obviously had a challenging job to take over when she took on that role. And as you can see, you know, they've come a long way in the last four years and some really kind words sent her way from the IOSH Board of Trustees. She's been a pleasure to deal with when I've had interactions with her. We're very grateful for her supporting the magazine by putting columns in the magazine and also being part of the podcasts and everything else that we've done. So to Bev, I say thank you for all of your hard work and wish you all the best in your retirement. So now it's time to go on to our main guest today, which is Alan Murray. Alan Murray, as you'll know, is the CEO of the British Safety Industry Federation, the BSIF. So if you didn't hear the start of this podcast, I mentioned that HSM and BSIF had partnered together to host a webinar on UKCA marking, which is particularly pertinent right now as we are going very quickly to the end of the transition period in the next couple of weeks from the European Union. So this session, which you can actually still listen to on demand by going to the HSM website, all you need to do is go to hsmsearch.com. Click on the webinars tab in the main navigation. You can listen to the UKCA marking webinar and what it means. 
straight through there. You can get your CPD certificate for attending. It was now a session and we had over 300 questions. It's phenomenal the amount of questions that we had. So that is something that I would urge you to do. But I wanted to sit down with Alan, who will now give you an overview of what we covered. But we'll also go over some questions that we didn't get time to ask during the webinar. So I sat down with Alan earlier today and here's what he had to say. Good morning, Alan. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks, Mark. How are you? Yeah, great. Great. Obviously, a couple of weeks ago, we partnered up to do a webinar all on UKCA marking. And I know this is particularly topical as we speak right now. It's the second week of December, believe it or not. Apparently, we are close or not close to a Brexit deal being agreed. So this makes this just as topical as we did a couple of weeks ago. Can you give us a brief overview on what was discussed during the webinar that you hosted with us? Yeah, of course. It's my pleasure. Well, at the start of the webinar, I, I suppose we really took the opportunity to have a, a look back at the very acute problems that occurred in 2020 I, as a result of the pandemic and the shortages of PPE. So with the huge surge in demand and the fracturing of the supply chains, we, as you know, saw an incredible surge in the amount of non-compliant PPE in Europe and in the UK, so so we took uh, we took the participants back through that, and we highlighted certain things that we had done. Um, we had a webinar with HSM in May, uh, where we educated as best we could the market on what to look for, but. Um, but we made the point in the webinar that between March and July, BSIF reported 300 different traders to the authorities, the authorities being the Office of Product Safety and Standards, HSE, and indeed uh, trading standards. So it was an incredible time, really. And, and I'm not finished. We're, we're still reporting as we, as we talk today. So also on the webinar, we touched on the easement of the CE conformity assessment. Uh, I, and I suppose ultimately we warned the market uh, to be ever vigilant uh, and what to look for. So, so that was our look back at the chaotic situation as, uh, as it impacted PPE. And then we went on to outline our interpretation of the UK conformity assessment which is the new regime to replace CE marking or CE conformity assessment, uh, which is our, our burden or opportunity, depending on how you look at it, uh, following our departure from the EU. So we talked about the timeline, um, the timeline being January 2021. And then we looked at the guidance on how to utilize the new regime. We talked about the conformity assessment bodies and their change in status from January. And we highlighted, of course, that the UK will be two distinct markets, which comprise of GB, England, Scotland and Wales, and Northern Ireland, with different rules for, for each of those entities. And we tried to give the economic operators as best we could uh, our, our view and our interpretation of the government's guidance. As you mentioned a moment ago, uh, as we talk at the moment, in the event of a deal, all of this could be out of date. But as we discuss this on, what is it, the 7th of December, the likelihood of a compre comprehensive economic trade agreement seems well it seems well i i would be pushed to be optimistic about it at this stage 
Well, the flip flops, isn't it, Alan? We, we talk about this in private quite a bit of trying to second guess what the government is or isn't going to do over a Brexit deal. Um, there's obviously history in the past of the European Union doing deals at the last minute. One thing that we can both safely agree on is it's certainly not a boring time in political history. That's for sure. And uh, what we record now could be very different than what we find out in 72 hours. Um, and I hope for the sake of everyone that is the case. But this webinar we did together uh, something that we organised and had to organise quite quickly, had a phenomenal response. We had over 1,400 people join us. All of the biggest brands, all of the key BSIF members were part of it. We were very proud to see um, all the key manufacturers be there. But it was the amount of questions, Alan, we had was just phenomenal. Over 300 questions in an hour. And and I know that was one of the things that when I told you that and I sent you the questions, you then, just like the webinar you said that we did in in May, you suddenly had a big job on your hands to try and give some brief responses to, to these questions, which of course you've done and are available on, on your website. Now, we did ask questions live, but there's only so much you can get through in a short period of time. So I thought what I'd like to do today, if you don't mind, is just pick out a few more of those questions. So I almost do this as somewhat of a follow up to the webinar and ask a couple of questions that came in that you have answered relatively shortly and to the point on your website, but maybe we can give a little bit more colour and flavour to here. Just before you do, Mark, if, yep. I, if I may, um, you talked about the participants on the webinar. I, I would also tell you that looking through the list, uh, there were government department people on that, there were trading standards people on that, and there were health and safety executive people on that, um, which is very encouraging to see. Uh, and, and it's... Uh, it's super encouraging that they look to BSIF as the authoritative voice. No, absolutely. I mean, we, we were joined by such a breadth of people across the sector and and that shows just how important this, this topic has been. It is obviously an ongoing topic. And and as I said, I'd like to ask a couple of questions now, almost as a follow-up to the webinar in terms of some questions that we didn't get time to go through during the webinar, but you have answered quite briefly online. We can give a little bit more colour and flavour to now. So the first question that came in from one of the listeners was, please can you confirm that even though the CA mark is available until 2023, from January the 1st, 2021, the UK CA mark will be required on either products or in a company document? What's the case there, Alan? This is, unlike many of the questions, the questions themselves had so many ifs and buts and supplementaries to them that it's always difficult to answer. The, the 2023 date for CE validity is not, is not accurate. Uh, we made the point that that was uh, okay as far as medical devices were concerned but not for PPE. So CE marking on PPE is acceptable throughout 2021. The UK CA mark for Great Britain must be applied from 2022 on the product or accompanying documentation. Okay, another question we had in was, please can you confirm just for 100% clarity, at what point, if any, must a product be only UKCA marked, i.e. can we continue to dual mark products ongoing over the next number of years? That's, that's quite straightforward. In essence, there's no requirement that product is only marked with UKCA. And yes, you can dual or multi-mark. And I, I would say the most common approach will be UK and CE. Okay, so the next question that's come in is, can products be marked UKCA and UKNI and CE? I, I probably have to defer a little bit on that, but in principle, yes. But I believe CE, um, which is applicable for Northern Ireland as well as UKNI. Um, so why would why would people have UKCA in addition to that? They could have it as a multi mark but not, as a, not necessarily as a process. If, if a product is conformity assessed by a UK approved body to be sold in GB, it will have UKCA. If a product is conformity assessed by a UK approved body for placing on the market in Northern Ireland, it would have UKNI. 
but for Northern Ireland, CE is acceptable because of unfettered access or, or because they have to stay regulatory aligned to the EU, sorry. So another question we had in was, is there any exemption for products where the UK CA mark cannot be placed on the physical product due to space constraints? Yes, in essence, the same uh, interpretation uh, applies as you would currently do with CE marking. So, for example, uh, an earplug is Category 3 PPE and has never had all the uh, product markings that would normally be required. It would go on its nearest form of packaging. So another question we had in was, will in these cases be possible to put a UK CA mark on external documents or packaging even after 2023? The, the, the straight answer is yes. The, the same rules. It's a very similar question to the last one. So another question we had in was, in the first instance where a UK CA mark can be applied to the packaging, does the term packaging include accompanying documentation, e.g. the user information sheet? Yes, that, that would be it, really. The, the guidance actually says accompanying documentation. So that's the specific guidance. I, and people often interpret accompanying documentation to include packaging because there are many products uh, currently CE marked where information has to be on the packaging. I'm thinking of a box of gloves, for example. So the information and the markings would be on the packaging. Right? And, and that forms the basis of um, information to accompany that product. You would need to have a separate declaration of conformity at the same time. Well, that gives us a, a fair flavour of some of the questions that came in. Now, I'd urge everybody to watch the webinar. You can do so on demand for free and you also get CPD points for looking at even on demand. All you need to do if you want to listen to the webinar that BSIF did with us is go to the Health and Safety Matters website, which is www.hsmsearch.com. And on there, just click on the webinars tab in the top right hand corner and you can see the webinar listed on there right at the top and you can register for free and you can listen to it on demand as many times as you want. It was a great session delivered by Roy Wilders and obviously Alan Murray. So please do listen to that. Now, one other thing before I let you go, Alan, that um, I've talked about in the news section of this podcast Obviously, it's been a very difficult year with COVID-19 and the pandemic, etc., to just be able to meet people face to face. And that has seen a number and pretty much all events continually moved backwards. And you've been a long time supporter of um, the health and safety event and you're a partner with us for the Safety and Health Excellence Awards. And obviously, we've seen the announcement that no longer is the health and safety event going to take place in April 2021. It's now moved to September 7th, 8th and 9th, 2021. But as a result of this, the unfortunate side for you and I is it's not safe for us to run an awards in partnership together in April. The 2021 awards, the Safety Health Excellence Awards, which incorporates the BSIF awards, was due to take place on the 29th of April as a live event at the Vox. And we normally have about 550 people go. But you and I have obviously had to take the tough decision that the sensible thing to do is we can't delay announcing the winners anymore and we need this to be a safe and fun evening. So we've decided to do it virtually, as I've explained on the news item on this podcast. So anyone that missed that at the start, it is going to take place on the 29th of April. 2021 and that'll be the winners for the 2020 awards and it's not just a very entertaining do which will have um, interactivity um, done digitally but there's more to it because we're actually putting it as part of the BSIF PPE conference which will be the first time that the BSIF has ever done a virtual conference in partnership with health and safety matters. So I know we can't give too much away, Alan, in terms of what the schedule is going to be for the BSIF PPE conference, but can you just give us a flavour before we announce in the new year exactly how you can register and what's on? Can you give us a flavour of the kind of things that you might want to touch or discuss during the PPE conference? Well, uh, I, I'm sure it'll come as no surprise that after the chaotic year that we've had in the PPE market, we took the decision that we would 
co-chair with with you guys the uh, PPE conference to look at what good PPE and good safety management policy, including PPE, would include. Um, I'm pleased to say we've got commitment from government departments, uh, HSE, uh, the Health and Safety Executive, OPSS, the Office of Product Safety and Standards, and, and various others to participate in that. Um, and, and we will cover we will cover different product groups, uh, what to look for, um, and, and we'll talk about other issues of uh, face fitting at the same time. So once we uh, once we publish, you will see a fairly comprehensive agenda, Mark. Yeah, I mean this 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 is a must attend for anyone with with, with interest in PPE. It, it's a top to bottom look at everything that's essential to do with making sure that you only use adequate PPE. Now, this will be done as part of the Safe and Health Excellence and BSIF Awards. So it will take place on the 29th of April, 2021. We will, in the new year, be opening a free registration for this. It'll be a daytime conference that will be immediately followed by the awards. And, you know, we're very excited to partner with the BSAF on this. As I said, it'll be completely free to attend and everyone that attends will get CPD points for attending. So keep your eyes peeled on the BSAF website, but also on our website, which as I said before is www.hsmsearch.com. And you'll be able to enjoy a whole day digital conference with networking opportunities, but also the opportunity to enjoy and see the winners of the Safe Health Excellence Awards and the BSIF Awards. So we'll release that information in the new year and we're very much looking forward to partnering with the BSIF on that. So Alan, always have to do to say thank you very much for joining us today and thank you for doing a fascinating webinar on UKCA marking. And as I've said before, if anyone wants to watch that again on demand, I'd urge you to do so. You get CPD points. Just go to hmsearch.com and click on the webinars tab. But Alan, as always, it's been a pleasure catching up with you. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mark. So, yeah, my thanks to Alan Murray for joining us again on this episode of the podcast. But as you heard through that interview, we have had to make the decision that the Safety and Health Excellence Awards will no longer be able to be held in person for obviously for safety reasons for COVID-19. But we will be running it on the 28th of April as planned, but virtually. And it will still be hosted by Alistair McGowan, who will do a comedy set and will be our presenter throughout the whole part of the awards. But perhaps what's even more interesting and exciting about this is the fact that it will be done as part of the first ever HSM BSIF PPE virtual conference. So all this will take place during the day on the 28th of April 2021. And... It'll be an opportunity to hear, as Alan said, everything that you need to know about PP in the current state of the market. But it also gives you great networking opportunities. You'll be able to network through direct messaging or offer video calls to other delegates and also to talk to the sponsors of the awards through that way as well and to speak to the speakers as well throughout it. And you'll be able to download information. So it's, it's a really great and intuitive platform. And we will be revealing the agenda in the new year in January and give you the link for where you can register up for free to not only come to the conference, but also to enjoy the awards and the opportunity to sit on virtual tables We're actually with other finalists from the awards and sponsors and other delegates. So it will be completely free and you'll get CPD for attending as well, which is a real bonus as well. So stick with us, keep your eyes peeled in the new year and we will give you all of that information. It's definitely a date not to be missed, 28th of April, 2021. So on PPE, I want to talk about a report on the government's PPE procurement crisis, which has been done from ARCO. So with the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic coming under growing parliamentary scrutiny, ARCO has published a position paper which is called Personal Protective Equipment and the Government's Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. So ARCO said with a right responsibility to comment, ARCO's report offers an insight into their experiences dealing with government bodies and other agencies as part of the PPE supply chain. It proposes a 10-point set of recommendations to prevent a repeat of the high-profile issues that were seen during the first wave of the crisis and to ensure that the country is better protected in any future pandemic. So the first stage of the crisis saw a severe global shortage of PP at a time where exceptional demand and poor centrally coordinated response, Arco said. Early in the pandemic, there were many examples of broken supply chains and frontline workers left without critical PPE. A number of suppliers like Arco were 
holding stock but unable to work with the government and its agencies to supply PPE where it is needed the most. So most recently, Arco has said, a National Audit Office report has highlighted examples of PPE supply chain contracts being awarded opaquely to organisations with no history of PPE manufacturing and supply who are ultimately unable to fulfil orders and in some cases non-compliant products were supplied that increases the risk to the public, care home staff and NHS workers. So to address these issues and ensure that further and future preparedness is readily available, ARCO has developed a set of recommendations based on its experiences in 2020, which is set out in its position paper. And these key highlights include the following. Registrations of competent PPE suppliers to be allowed to supply CAT2 and CAT3 products, ensuring product compliance and quality. Point two is the Department of Health and Social Care to conduct a thorough review and stress test of its systems from the perspective of suppliers and buyers. Point three says reform the government's purchasing portal to screen out unsuitable or unqualified companies. Point four says an educational program to upskill NHS trust local authorities and care home procurement offices in how to understand PPE standards and source purchase suitable equipment. Also, the government should publish a roadmap for the full implementation of the PPE regulations to reduce the likelihood of poor performance and ineffective products entering the market. So, Arco's chairman, Thomas Martin, has said, 2020 will be a year that none of us will forget. It's been a year of sadness and uncertainty to so many people. Our core purpose is to help keep people safe. And we've responded immediately to the pandemic, and as soon as it was declared, working 24-7 to help make sure that the frontline staff were protected. He goes on to say, from the outset, we were both frustrated with the procurement system and deeply concerned by some of the simple mistakes made across the UK through a lack of experience of procuring the PPE needed. The NAO report and findings very much reflect this experience. As an established safety business, we feel it's our duty to report our experiences to support the government in continuing to deal with the pandemic. We urge the government to act on our recommendations and to ensure that we are better prepared for any future emergencies. So you can actually see the full report and the other five points that they've listed on the ARCO website. So if you're looking for that address to see the full report, it's www.arco.co.uk forward slash recommendations. So that's arco.co.uk forward slash recommendations. You know, just finishing off on this point, it's difficult, again, to disagree with anything that ARCO has raised here. It was well publicised some massive cock-ups, to be quite frank, that happened during the pandemic unsuitable PPE came into the market. Unsuitable PPE was bought, from my memory, in, from Turkey at huge costs. It just couldn't be used. Um, it's always difficult in a pandemic, in this situation, when, you, when you're not prepared. And I think that's Arca's issue, is that you need to be better prepared, is what they're saying. But there was an urgent need for frontline staff and many others to have this PPE. So Arco has gone into great detail of where it thinks the government fell short. But more importantly, I think they're going to say how this can be dealt with moving forward. It's a really interesting report, really good insight, and I'd urge you to, to take a look into it. So now on to our final news story on this episode of the HSM podcast. And that's a story that we wrote up a couple of weeks back that dust breaches are up 23% on construction sites. So the Building Safety Group, BSG, has reported a 23% rise in the number of dust breaches occurring on construction sites. BSG's report was based on 9,000 independent site inspections conducted over a six-month period from June to November 2020. Two periods were compared which revealed the increase between June and August. There were 209 infringements recorded. This was against 258 non-compliances that were catalogued between September and November 2020. The most common types of breaches found included the failure to set up effective dust suppression and extraction procedures on the site. Not having dust masks face fit tested was also a common violation recorded by BSG advisors. And each year, thousands of construction workers contract or die from respiratory diseases due to breathing in dust and fumes. And obviously managing controlling exposure to dust has become a major challenge for this industry. BSG's report coincides with the health and safety executives recent month-long initiative inspecting respiratory risks and occupational lung disease in the construction sector. That's something that we actually covered in a previous edition of the podcast, so I'd urge you to go back into our archives and listen to that. The primary focus was to identify what measures had been put in place to protect workers' lungs from asbestos, silica and wood dust. HC inspectors also looked for evidence of employers and workers knowing the risks, planning their work and using appropriate controls, enforcement 
was there for when required if it was found that people had not been adequately protected. So BSG's managing director, Stephen Bell, has commented, construction workers have a high risk of developing these diseases because many common construction tasks can create dust levels. Work-related cancers, mainly linked to asbestos and silica, are estimated to kill 3,500 people from the industry every year. Thousands of others suffer life-changing illnesses from their work. He goes on to say, Our advice is to always look at ways for stopping or reducing the amount of dust before the job is started. For example, different materials could be used, less powerful tools or other work methods. Once these controls have been put in place, it is of course vital to check that they are working properly and effectively. So pretty stark statistics there. So we go back to the start of this, you know, this reporting here, the Building Safety Group, 23% rise in the number of dust breaches. We have talked about silica dust exposure. We, we, we talked about that uh, with Casella on a past issue. We have talked to the Health and Safety Executive about dust and their campaign that they've um, recently been inspecting construction sites. I think it was on the last episode of the podcast. I think the key thing to take away from here is just that just that statistic that three and a half thousand people die every year from work related cancers, and I've said on this podcast many times before, everyone has a right to come home from work safe, and that is a shocking amount of people. And I know a lot of it's historic exposure, but it doesn't make it any better. But we do have to obviously look to the future of what controls we put in place, and and the BSG have come up with some key points there in terms of. One of the key issues is just making, stopping or reducing the amount of dust that's created in the first place. Then also ensuring that proper PPE is provided and making sure that both the preparation and prevention of exposure is consistently monitored and it's consistently monitored that the correct PPE is there. You know, I, I think it's probably the right time to say fit to fit scheme is absolutely essential that the BSIF have. It's essential that you provide PPE to your staff that properly fits the face of the wearer. That's the only way they are properly protected. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't already done so, go to the BSIF website for more information on that and how you can get fit testing. It's absolutely essential way of protecting workers. Hopefully, now that campaigns like um, the BSIF have had and HSE and obviously what the Building Safety Group is talking about here have raised even more awareness on this and focus and more control measures are in place. Hopefully over time, we'll see a drastic reduction in the amount of people that are have exposure to dusts that can be so devastating to their health and obviously very much potentially fatally. So, yeah, it, it, it's it's not a great statistic at all, but the controls are there and it's something that we all need to keep in mind. So that pretty much wraps up the news for this edition of the podcast. So as I said, opening this edition of the podcast, you can see news daily through our website. You can see all the latest products, prosecutions, news and in-depth features and case studies just by visiting our website on a daily basis. All you need to do is visit www.hsmatters.com. While you're there, you can look at our webinars archive and get CPD by listening back to any of the free webinars on demand there. You can also now get CPD just by reading the magazine. So if you're not reading the magazine already, you can do so digitally or we can post you a copy. It's completely free to sign up. Again, just go to our website and you can sign up to that or the e-newsletter. And that, as I said before, is www.hsmatters.com. So we will obviously be back in January for the next of our monthly editions of the Health and Safety Matters podcast. Just want to thank our sponsors, the Health and Safety event. And as I said at the opening of the show, the dates for the health and safety events, which take place at the NEC in Birmingham, is now the 7th to the 9th of September 2021. It's completely free for you to register. All you need to do is go to www.healthandsafetyevent.com. It's well worth going. It's co-located with the fire safety event, the facilities event, the security event and the emergency services show. And of course, Health and Safety Matters and myself actually put on the content of the Health and Safety Matters Knowledge Exchange, which is sponsored by Southalls. So that is a, a great interactive theatre where we actually don't do PowerPoint presentations. We set the agenda and you come and ask the questions as the audience. There's a nice expert panel up for every session on a range of topics from legislation through to mental health, work at height, all the key topics facing all of you in your day-to-day -day job and you set the agenda. We may have set the topic based on feedback from you, but you ask the questions. So it's well worth coming 7th and 9th of September 2021. So yeah, thank you to 19 Group and the Health and Safety Event for being our sponsors this year. But actually, thank you to all of you. Thank you to all of you that have 
in your droves listened and downloaded this podcast over the year. I greatly appreciate it. The feedback we've had has been excellent. So thank you very much. But do get in touch with me if you want to have certain interviewees on there, certain questions you'd like us to ask, anything you'd like me to cover. And you can do so just by using the hashtag HSM podcast on either LinkedIn or Twitter. Or, of course, you can email me direct, which is msenet at westernbusiness.media. So feel free to drop me a line at any time. And But it's because of you taking time out of your day to listen to this that this podcast is, uh, has, has grown so quickly. So we're very, very grateful to all of you. So until next year, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for this year that have been on the podcast, all of our listeners and our sponsor, the Health and Safety Events. And I hope all of you have a fantastic and very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I'll be back in January for the next edition of the Health and Safety Matters podcast.